What's up, everybody? How are we doing after another day of listening to the newest wannabe lawyer, Daryl Brooks, questioning witnesses in a day that I think was perhaps the worst day for him so far of the trial. And today felt like the beginning of the end for Daryl Brooks and any holes he thinks he's poking or arguments he thinks he's making legally speaking or trying to trick the jurors, whatever it may be. This is why the courtroom is the even playing field where the truth should come out and justice should prevail. And I think it is happening in court and we're learning what happened, how it happened and potentially why it happened with each witness that comes and tells their story of what they saw and heard and felt the day of the Christmas parade. We're going to get into that testimony and a lot more on today's video. I want to say thanks for everybody who's waiting in the chat to talk about this case, who joined me earlier to talk about the Parkland shooting case, and who always comes on, spreads some good vibes in the chat, makes this fun for everybody, even if we talk about difficult topics, and helps us understand something that's maybe out of some of our purview or expertise. That's what makes this fun. That's what the channel is all about. Talking to a lawyer about lawyer stuff and talking to people about stuff people enjoy talking about. There is a membership option. RF decided to join tonight. Thank you, RF. We are working on our next members only uh, video. Uh, we usually do some more lighthearted, less legal intensive stuff in those videos. And before we get to the recap, Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and like the video. I'm going to answer some questions here at the beginning. And then as I always do at the end, answer as many questions as I possibly can, because I know that's why you come. And I know if you have a question, chances are a couple other people have it as well. And that's what you come here is to learn more about the system and why things happen. And Azam is queen of questions here. And she's got a couple that we're going to discuss. Hey, Peter, he calls himself my client. Is this common slash correct use for a pro se defendant? It is never correct use to speak about yourself in the third person, if you ask me. But it is kind of common in pro se defendants because they don't know what to do. And it's very awkward to say, I, if you remember back to Ronnie O'Neill, I'm pretty sure you were around for that, Azam. If not, a lot of people in this chat were around for Ronnie O'Neill's trial where he said, did I do this to you? Did I do this to you? Did you tell me this? And that sounds kind of just as awkward when you're the one asking the question. So there's no simple and smooth way to ask people questions when you're the defendant in your own case, which is why it's abnormal for this to happen and very abnormal for it to work. Another question from Azam. He kept saying grounds even after the prosecutor slash judge stated the ground. Speculation, relevance, compound, are grounds for objections. Right, Peter? Yes, Azam, look at you. You're learning our legal system here and you're understanding the process better than Mr. Brooks is at this point. And he's just saying it because he thinks that's something that protects the record from appeal. That's what he thinks he's doing when he grunts almost and says grounds right after the question. Uh, Tony Badalamenti, why does he keep asking, is that your judicial determination? And the judge refuses. If the judge said yes, what implications? So a lot of people have asked me this question as well. We've talked about it on some other streams. I think it's just him Again, thinking he's creating an issue for appeal because there are certain standards when you appeal things in a case like, is it uh, an abuse of discretion by the judge? Is there a statute on point? Is there a rule on point? Is this based on case law or common law, as he likes to talk about? And I think it's just another one of his ways to try to muddy the waters for appeal, potentially. Koryama Rosado. Can he get the death penalty? No, they do not have the death penalty here. Somebody else asked, yeah, Sean R., do they have to have a penalty phase trial? No, um, it'll be a sentencing phase. It won't be another trial. I don't I don't think so, at least. I'm pretty sure the judge will, will determine the sentencing here. That's what it would be in Florida. Mo, remember the bad weather and alarms during Amber's testimony? A freaking tornado came during him questioning the man who watched his daughter go flying. You can't make this stuff up. And I think that's why you all are so interested in some of these trials and these cases because it's it's literally unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Like if they wrote this in a movie, you'd probably say, yeah, right. And Mo, you're right. The universe or something 
knows what to do stuff, knows when to do stuff, it seems. It's almost like someone's in control. Chris Kalansky just subscribed. That's fun. Yeah, we've got a, a whole new crew of subscribers from this Brooks trial, and I always like to find out when you guys sub in a trial like this as we kind of grow together in a community and we learn what cases you want to hear about and talk about next. So if you did just subscribe, let me know in the comments. It's always fun to shout that out. Patricia, Peter, DB's bail was set inappropriately low. Will Wisconsin do something about this problem? Do you find it odd that not one unharmed person got the license number or even the first three letters or numbers? So it's an interesting question, I guess. And today we got someone who looked him right in the eye and identified him as he drove by them. It is an interesting point, but I will say when traumatic situations are happening and you're not just viewing them like, you know, from afar, when you're that close to the car, you're probably worried about getting hit. Most of them were talking about how they were focused on their children, getting their children out of the way. Or if they were the baseball coach or the dance coach, you're worried about getting the, the kids you brought with you out of the way. So I can understand why their focus may have been elsewhere. I, I can understand that. Tori. Azam is queen and I am happily the princess. Haha, <laughs> the princess of questions here. Uh, felt like today the way he treated the victims was brutal. I got angry. He was disrespectful in my opinion. And yes, as you guys can see, lots of questions come in. We're very interactive on this channel if you haven't noticed it already. Um, and I need to get to the, to the recap or else I'll never get there because the questions are never endless. Louise Lane, is there such a thing as witness abuse? Yes, there is. It will be objected to, badgering. Um, he can be shut down and he hasn't gotten to that level yet, even though I know many people would find it disrespectful and hard to watch. And it was hard to watch today. Amanda, Diane, Hey, I made it for a live loving your coverage of this bizarre trial. Keep it up, Peter. Thank you, Amanda. It is very, very bizarre. A judicial determination. Dinkus Minkus is just the judge making a decision, making a call based on her discretion. Jen Burns. I've seen your name a bunch in the chat and it's funny because I knew, I grew up and I knew somebody named Jenny Burns. Um, I'm wondering why the judge hasn't explained that they are giving him grounds if he'll let them speak. She helped with other things. Why not this? She has said it. She said it during breaks and she's told him many times. I believe um, when she cites a rule, she wants him to go look it up so he can understand what grounds of objection are, what hearsay is. She cites 90 point whatever and she wants him to go look it up. Doesn't seem like he is. Sparkling Dragon popped in from Trials of the Century. Shout out to Rob. Had to because I'm addicted to this case and all the knowledge you freely offer and give. It's much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sparkling Dragon, for being here and checking this out with us. Hey, that's what's good about YouTube. The videos will be around. So if you got to join the Rewatch crew for any of these videos, that's cool. Appreciate uh, the support and you coming and hanging out with us. Radio Chaos, last one before I get to the recap. It seems like Sovereign Citizen's game plan is to frustrate people to the point of exhaustion. Yes, it is. And it's almost like you believe enough and you tell yourself enough and you convince yourself enough. Maybe somebody else will believe and be convinced too. Not in the legal system. Uh, it's a very stubborn system. And it ain't going to happen for this sovereign citizen, in my opinion. Okay, let's get to it. I've had a lot of people ask about subject matter jurisdiction. He brings it up at the beginning of every day. Subject matter jurisdiction simply means that this is a subject matter and a case that this court has jurisdiction to hear. So that means what court should hear what kind of case depends on what the case is about. Is it a federal question? Then it needs to be in federal court. Um, like, is it an EEOC case? That's going to be in federal court most of the time if you're under the federal rules. An FLSA claim, a Fair Labor Standards Act, if you don't get paid minimum wage in your state, you would file that in federal court because that's a federal statute. They have subject matter jurisdiction. State court does not. Um, but if you use the state EEOC rules, then you would file it in state court. If it's a car accident case, you file it in state court, unless certain UM cases that have diversity of citizenship, one client lives in Florida, one lives in California, then that can be removed to federal court because of diversity of citizenship. Both parties are not from Florida. There are different reasons you can use federal court, state court, what city it's supposed to be in, whether it's a county court case based on money. We talked about this when some civil lawsuits are filed and they say, you know, they're asking for $15,000 or $30,000. That's a jurisdictional amount. 
So if the case is more than $30,000, it's going to be a circuit court case. Circuit court case, that's the jurisdiction. If it's under $30,000, it's a county court case. That's that jurisdiction. So what case it is, there's a proper juris jurisdiction for the subject matter, the location, the venue. And this case is in the right court. You don't have to worry about that. He keeps acting like it's not and thinks if he keeps saying it, that that's going to mean it's going to change, but it's not. He also asked and wanted to call the state of Wisconsin to the stand. He wants to call the state of Wisconsin to the stand. And I saw a ton of questions about this. What does this mean? How's that possible? That's interesting. Can somebody actually do that? How would that work? So many times in cases like this, and I think in this case, from time to time, a law enforcement officer who I think already testified has been sitting out at council table with the state attorney's office. Law enforcement and the state attorneys are agents of the state. So when law enforcement testifies, they can technically be an agent of the state of Wisconsin. The state attorney's office, people have asked, how are they the plaintiff? The judge is also saying they're the plaintiff. What does that mean? Well, the people of the state of Wisconsin and their interests are represented by the state attorney's office. Meaning, if you are wronged, if you are injured, if somebody commits a crime against you, well, the state has the jurisdiction and the right to bring criminal charges. We can't throw people in jail civilly or as private lawyers. People have asked me before, can you help me file this criminal claim? No. State attorneys can file criminal charges. We cannot. We can only file civil charges. So they do represent the state of Wisconsin and agents of the state of Wisconsin are testifying in this case. You can't call the entity that is the state of Wisconsin to the stand in a criminal case. That's not how it works. All right, let's get to the first witness, the Citizens Bank. And I'm going to probably not hit every witness, but I'll hit a lot of them. The, the Citizens Bank witness who did not, did not care to be questioned by Darrell Brooks. She did not have any interest in answering his questions. She was short and to the point. She barely looked at him. And when she did, it looked like she was looking through him. She was stone cold. And I thought she crushed. I thought she crushed. He asked her a lot of questions about, you know, who the injured party is and if they're a claimant in this case and the jury having a right to this information about who the injured party is. The judge again said, move on or I'm cutting off this cross-examination. And to me, Daryl Brooks making that argument to the jury as a speaking objection is inappropriate. The judge lets him know it's inappropriate. And he's trying to get the jury to think the state of Wisconsin was hiding something from Daryl Brooks. And he's trying to do that. And criminal defendants do that all the time, even sometimes with lawyers. Actually, you heard it in the uh, Nicholas Cruz case. The closing argument of the criminal defense attorney in that case was basically like the prosecution's intimidating witnesses. So this is not an abnormal thing for criminal defendants, criminal defense lawyers to argue to a jury that the state is overpowering, the state is um, pulling the wool over your eyes. They don't want you to know the whole story, especially if you're a sovereign citizen like Darrell Brooks. You know, you're, you're going to feel that way the whole time. And people said, are you worried that that's going to happen and that the state may may um, find him not guilty? And you're all starting to think a little bit like trial lawyers where you nitpick every word that's said and everything that comes out in a trial. I overanalyze everything that comes out because I can be reading a deposition, listening to witness testimony, objecting at the same time, while also, you know, sweating the small stuff and thinking, is this, is this little bad part going to come out? Because you got to be ready for everything. And you got to know how to attack each part. However... When you have a case with overwhelming evidence in your favor and the defendant saying, I don't consent to being called by the name that I am and making big deals about dark skin, black skin, tan skin, Hispanic skin, African-American skin to try to turn this into something as the witnesses, eventually they start to see that maybe he's the one you can't trust. Maybe he's the one trying to trick you, not the state attorneys, at least in this case. What's up, Christy? All right. 
Then let's talk to, I think, Bone Steel was his name. Like, that dude did not look like somebody I want to mess with. Uh, I think it was the husband of the prior witness driving the float. Again, had some connection to Citizens Bank. Distinctly remembers the red vehicle running someone over. He saw the person and knew that she had passed. He, again, looked like he wanted to come out of the witness stand and go over to Daryl Brooks's uh, counsel table. And to me, he was having none of it as well. He was having none of Daryl Brooks's questions. And it, it looked like, I mean, that dude was a big dude. I mean, that was a big dude. And he had the long hair, don't care. You know, we like the long hair dudes on this channel. Um, and Daryl Brooks, I don't know if he was a little nervous or what, but he started out this cross-examination by crying and, you know, taking a moment to compose himself and making sure he apologized to the jury and everybody knew that he was composing himself and he felt really bad about it. And, um, yeah, the water bottle looked like a, a little kitty one. And I think he went through a couple of them. Um, but the questions about seeing brake lights was weird. Trying to say, oh, if you saw brake lights, he must have been hitting the brakes. Right after he said, I saw you run over a person's body. It's like, are you just, are you just missing that? Are you, are you just, do you think the jury's not listening to him say that part of the question because you said the brake lights were hit? He argued with him quite a bit. The guy was giving him no easy answers. The judge was even like, hey, dude, just answer the questions. Um, but he was like, I'm not trained in this. I did not go write stuff down. I did not make a report. When you go through something like this, you don't focus on those things. That was his testimony. Because he was trying to pack the stuff up. They didn't let him take his car. They didn't let him take the float because they were now all parts of evidence. All the doors were locked. This guy's trying to get out of this situation. And he wasn't able to. And then there was a male spectator who brought his daughter's vehicle veered toward them and then turned away. And Brooks tried to make it seem like, oh, see, it veered away. It's almost like he thinks the jury is only listening to part of the story. Like he honked. Like this is how Daryl Brooks wants to tell the story. I was driving through there because I had nowhere else to go. I honked. I swerved. I hit my brakes. I did everything I can to avoid people. Good job by me. Leaving out the part that you ran over and killed multiple people and 60 plus people were injured and went to the hospital. He just thinks the jury's going to forget that part because he honked his horn. And I don't think jurors are going to leave their common sense at the door, as we say in trials all the time. Don't leave your common sense at the door. I really don't think they're going to do that. So during this witness, something, and listen, I like to keep it balanced here, okay? And while I disagree with a lot of what Daryl Brooks is doing, I'm watching the state attorney and I'm watching the judge to see how they're handling this difficult situation. And kudos to them because it's a miserably tough situation. But if you listen carefully, there are times where the state will object. The judge will grant their objection before they even say why they objected during Daryl Brooks's cross. And it happened during this male spe spectator. And the judge will sustain it. And Brooks even asked one time. And the judge gave reasoning. Didn't even ask the state. She explained to Daryl Brooks why she sustained the objection. She has never done that for Daryl Brooks. I see some people commenting, don't you think she's coddling him too much, helping him too much? No, I don't think she is. I think she's been appropriate with Brooks. I think she's been too easy on the prosecution. It feels like they're on a team. And... As much as she probably does feel like she's on a team with them because they're both dealing with this difficult defendant, she is not on their team. She should not be sustaining objections and telling them the grounds for why they're objecting. And I would be nervous if I was the state attorney if she was doing that. I wouldn't, that's not what I would want. Guy thought he was going 25 to 30 miles an hour. Brooks kind of picked that apart a little bit. But this guy, this spectator, just seemed so honest. You listen to him. He wasn't stretching. He wasn't trying to make it seem worse than it was. Even the guy, the couple before, they were trying to get their shots in when they could. And you can't blame them, right? You can't blame them when they said, I watched you run over somebody. They were trying to get their shots in. This guy was just so calm, honest. And, and I was just like, I believe everything this guy says. 
This guy tells me he was going 25 to 30 miles an hour. I believe this guy. I just believe what this guy says. That's, that's what I remember ringing in my head as I was listening to his testimony on two times speed. Next, we get to a female spectator who brought three kids. Her five-year-old was struck six stitches with a gash above his eye. I mean, imagine that. Imagine how mad you would be at Daryl Brooks if he hit your child and you had to take him to the hospital for six stitches for a gash above his eye that was so deep that glue wouldn't handle it. Then he tries to make her seem like she didn't really care because she didn't follow up with law enforcement. Again, not something I think anybody's going to knock her for. Um, the judge did at this point tell the jury to disregard the inaccurate statement of law made about the plaintiff and threatened to stop cross again. Here's what's interesting. She tells him, ask relevant questions or I'm cutting you off for cross-examination. And this whole thing Daryl Brooks is trying to do to create appellate issues, right? Trying to say the judge is overstepping her bounds. She's um, crossing the line, uh, judicial discretion too far. Yet when she gives him that ultimatum a couple of times, he says no further questions and stops his cross-examination. If it was me as a criminal defense lawyer trying to set this up for appeal, doing all these you know circus moves that Daryl Brooks is doing, I would at some point keep asking that question and make her cut me off, make her make the call, make her use her judicial discretion that we can then say was an overstep and reversible error later, make her make the call. But he hasn't done that yet, which again, just reminds us he's not a lawyer. Firefly said, I have to think the jury is done with him and on to him. That's usually what happens in these situations. That's usually what happens. That's what happened in my case against a sovereign citizen. Male spectator. Vehicle struck his daughter, three years old, and she flew across the street 15 feet. That was the last witness of the day. That's what I started with. If you're the jury and you hear that, three years old. She has blood all over her face. She had a torn spleen, a broken nose, road rash, cuts, and required facial surgery. And guess what? This guy looked Daryl Brooks in the eye, described him to law enforcement as an African-American male with a beard. That's what he saw. He was 20 feet away. Brooks spent 10 minutes talking about, well, what, to this black box here or to that table or over here? How What's 20 feet away? And the guy was like, listen, man, I estimated it at 20 feet, closer than our two tables are together. This guy was the most excruciating for me to watch. I'm just thinking about my kids, if that happened to my kids, how I would feel and how he was carrying his little girl in his arms, running back, trying to seek medical attention. And he's from Waukesha and grew up there. And knew where the hospital was, that it was close by, thank God. And, you know, she ended up being okay. Tried to get into all these details about skin color and 20 feet versus something else. The jury was not buying it. Of course, we had the weather in the middle of his cross-examination and then the weather, weather cutting our day short. And if you remember, what was interesting about the weather discussion, I had some notes here on it. I think they may have been on my phone. I, there was some interesting discussion about the weather. The state did not want to break. They did not want to break for the day. And they are worried that this case is going to take a lot longer than they planned. They don't want to draw it out. They don't want delays. They want to get this to the jury to get a verdict. Brooks, on the other hand, he actually kind of seems like he's having a good time at this point. He gets to put on his suit every day. He gets to come make arguments. He's not doing a horrible job from time to time. He gets to come up with questions. He gets to talk to people. But what he said was very interesting to me. He said that he doesn't want to come back because of the severe weather and risk the cameras going down because this is a public televised trial. He knows there are cameras in the courtroom and I think he likes it. I think he is enjoying the cameras in the courtroom and people seeing this and people talking about this. So when we talk about it, we do have to focus on what a horrible idea it is to represent yourself, how awkward it is to talk about 
the person you represent as a third party intervener and you don't consent to being called by your name and how when people literally look you in the eye and tell you, you punched them in the face, you ran over their friend, you hit their child and you think in your head, because you're saying the plaintiff as the state of Wisconsin is not taking the stand. It's not going well, Mr. Brooks. It's not going well. This evidence is pointing towards only one fair and just result for all 76, I believe, charges that are left. Brenda Davis just said a question. Do you think he will win? What do you guys think? Do you think I think he's going to win? What, what is your guess to, to where I'm leaning so far? Case isn't over, so I'm not going to give my verdict, but I have a pretty strong lean. Let's get to some questions. The fun part of the video here. If you haven't subscribed already, take a second, hit that subscribe button, especially if you're new from the Brooks case and you haven't followed any other cases. Subscribing's free. Membership's not. Pia O'Brien decided to join as a member. If you want to do that, video, uh, I mean, the video description, there's a link to join, but at least subscribe and hit that like button and let your friends know if they're interested in the Daryl Brooks trial. We're breaking it down here, hopefully every day if time allows. Would you do a mock court versus sovereign citizen to teach the masses the truth? I think it would help a lot of people. Honestly, it, that sounds like banging my head against the wall, galactic historian. It really feels like banging my head against the wall. When logic and some common sense, when you don't, you know what I find? It's, I can disagree with people. I like disagreeing with people and, and having discussions, but you have to have a base that you're coming from. Like we're going to agree that, you know, this is truth or this is where we're starting or this is what we're trying to accomplish. And you can start there. You can talk about a lot of things. Jay Goss, uh, when he was asking questions about his hair, I kept thinking, can the witness say, I'm feeling forced to change my answer and lie under oath? No. Well, can they say that? Sure. But the judge would say, well, don't do that. No witness would really do that while on the stand. Um, and they shouldn't do that, obviously, while on the stand. Uh, Tony Badalamonte, thank you for the super sticker. Johnny with a big one. John O'Rourke. I'm a few minutes late, but Azam mentioned it would be hard for her to make this live stream. But this super chat is in honor of Azam, a.k.a. one of our leaders. She's the best of Peter's great live chat. Why did she end so early? Other reason than the weather. No, it was the weather. She seemed really worried. Um, she wanted to, she didn't want, here's the other thing. We always have to worry about jurors. We don't want the jurors thinking, my two kids are at my house with my wife. My kids are at school. Are, who's going to get them from school? I don't want my wife driving in this, or I don't want my husband driving in this. I need to go pick up my my kids or, you know, whatever it may be. My my mother, my sister, my brother, I need to help them. I need to do something. I mean, we. I know from the hurricane, they would have called trial when the hurricane was coming our way because we got to prepare. And the judge was going to help people make preparations or fix things if the tornado or whatever weather came through. It was, it was almost all because of weather, why they ended early. I mean, I think it was completely about weather, why they ended early today. RF, the new member. Hi, Peter. Wonder why the judge seems so very easy on Brooks. Why is she doing that? That is how you have to, I almost said play it, which may, may have been inappropriate. That's how you have to work with a pro se defendant as to not trample on their rights, give them every opportunity for a fair trial. They usually get convicted. And then you have a lot less issues for appeal than if you were really hard on them. I don't think she's too easy on him, if I'm being honest. She is going a little easy, but not too easy. Marty Ferguson, did you hear his new objection? Asked and answered. Yes. He's picking up some from what the state's um, – I think he's actually picking up some of the ones that the judge is sustaining from the state, which has been asked and answered a few times. Team YouTube, can the prosecution let the witness uh, let the witnesses know to expect certain questions from him, i.e., did you get the license plate number? So they should have done that during preparation. They can't go back and tell them, tell the witnesses what's been going on during the trial, what questions and answers have come out. If they could, they'd probably prep them a lot with the plaintiff being the state of Wisconsin questions. If I was them, I may ask the judge because sometimes you can ask the judge, can I tell the witnesses he's going to ask these bogus questions so that they know how to respond so it doesn't confuse the jury because he shouldn't be asking them. The judge is trying to shut it down, but he does keep asking them. So there's at least a non-zero chance 
that it does confuse the jury or makes the jury say, is the state actually hiding something? What's going on? So I do think that that is, you know, part of uh, the potential problem here. Beverly, how would an attorney be censored by the court were he or she to disrupt the trial the way the Brooks continuously does? It's become a mockery of the system. They'd get booted. They'd get held in contempt. It wouldn't happen. They'd be disciplined by um, their bar. It just would not happen. This would not happen with a with a real lawyer that's barred because we're subject to the rules of our bar association, of our state bar. We could lose our license, lose our ability to make money. Um, so that really wouldn't happen. Melanie was wrong with my 1.3K guest last night. Love to see uh, you getting bigger and bigger. It's so well-deserved. Thanks, Utrid. We all appreciate you. This case is nuts. Yeah, we got over 2,000 last night, Melanie. 2,000. Uh, maybe stop while you're driving a car through a parade, Mo says. Yeah, I think if you just actually come to a complete stop, you can't hurt anybody in a car at that point. Connor Garati. This trial, like Ted Bundy, is very bad to watch. It is. It is hard to watch. It's not just bad to watch. It is really hard to watch this trial. Um, because there are so many frustrating portions to it, especially for you all that you want to see justice. You understand that uh, most of you understand are very understanding that criminal defendants do have this constitutional right. They can have a trial by jury. They can plead their case. They can poke holes. They can hold the state to their burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. A lot of us in here have seen verdicts. We don't necessarily agree with, but we understand the system and, you know, we understand the process, but this is more difficult um, than your average trial. I, I would definitely agree with you there, Connor. RF, thank you so much for the super sticker. For all the new members and new subscribers, it's awesome that you're here. We appreciate you hit that like button. So if anybody else is out there searching for a Brooks recap, they can come here and get it and have their questions answered. Uh, Janine M is also a new member. Always fun to get new members. Celebrity and Entertainment News Commentary is a new subscriber. Thanks for joining us here. Sub into the channel. Mo, as a juror, we don't notice stuff that the judge is doing wrong, just FYI, for the most part. Absolutely. I think you're right. And how would you? And the jurors always think the judge is right and what the judge is doing is correct. So when she says the jurors will ignore that misstatement of the law by Brooks, he went like this. It was like, you could see it in his mask. His eyes got big. He was shocked. And he was like, are you seriously going to say that about me in front of the jury? And she did. The jury listens to that stuff. John O'Rourke, do you believe the jurors could actually sense or feel that Brooks could be asking emotionally damaging questions. Thanks, Peter, a.k.a. Pan the Man. And that'd make you Rufio, right? Pan the Man. Um, I think the jurors are, are emotionally intelligent enough for the most part, not everybody is, to tell how this is brutal for the witnesses and how cold his questions can feel when he's asking them. I do think that. RF, she should just cut him off and or remove him on all of these things he continues to do that, is, that he's already been told about. She does warn him. Um, she does tell him not to. She does warn him that she's going to cut off Cross, the ones that she reiterates over and over again that she's already shut down. She gives him another chance, but she's usually trying to shut it down. K Parr is a new member. Welcome K Parr to the crew here. A lot of new members from this case. Not just subs, but a lot of new members from this trial. That's awesome. Jamie, love your take on things. You're the best. Thank you, Jamie. Also a member here with the crew. And in case you can't tell, a huge part of these videos are and is the chat and the questions and what you all bring to the table that make it interesting. And then so many responses come in the chat from my answers to the questions. So that's what builds the, the really fun, interactive content here. When I give speeches or talk at seminars, I always try to make it interactive. There's nothing more boring than somebody just talking at you for an hour. Beth Vanderhust, do you think he will take the stand? No, I'm going to say no. He's handled it decently well um, for the situation he's in. And I think the best strategy would be to get your argument out an opening statement and closing argument, get your story out there, not take the stand and subject yourself to cross-examination. 
but he's in a tough position factually. So I don't really think it makes a difference. Marty Ferguson is also a new member and we've seen Marty's name a bunch through the questions. So thank you, Marty taking the plunge here. I found you the other day and have been with you ever since. I have a question. Um, I tried to ask earlier about the Cruz case. Also, if he doesn't know a Daryl Brooks, who is he defending? He's defending a third party intervener, not named Daryl Brooks and not named he or the defendant. I think he's okay being called the alleged defendant. So maybe that's who he's representing. Uh, what I didn't see the question about the Cruz trial, but I'm happy to answer it if I do see it. Carla Riley, thank you for the super sticker. Mindy Hunt Beach. Peter, if you were the judge, would you do anything different than this judge is? I would be harder on the prosecution. I would not let them ask leading questions. I would not let them elicit hearsay. I would hold them to the rules. I would basically play criminal defense attorney from the, from the bench, making sure that if anything inappropriate is coming out, I'm not letting it come out. I'm not letting it come into evidence. I'm protecting the record to make sure no inadmissible evidence comes in to open this up for an appeal. That's, that's the one thing I would do a little differently than this judge. Firefly, he is setting this up for what the sovereign citizens are known for. Paper terrorism and court system. At least that is what the research says. Thoughts, correct. Correct. Muddy the waters. That's that's what's trying to happen here. And it fails. The, the result is never what they want, but the process sometimes is, unfortunately, which is chaos. Vinny Pickering. I think he chose to defend himself to get satisfaction from hearing what he did to all the victims. He's emotionless. This is the part that bothers me the most. And if it's true, I can understand why people have a pro have a problem with this right of a defendant. I do think that's the side we have to err on, but getting your rocks off doing something like this, there's, I almost feel like there should be an enhanced penalty if you lose, but that's, that's like saying exercising your constitutional rights ends up getting you with enhanced penalties, which I'm vehemently against. But this is a struggle to watch something like this. Melissa Lee, would he have to personally pay for a lawyer for appeal or would one be appointed for him? He could get a public defender appointed to him for appeal. And we're up over 2,100. We're almost breaking last night's stream cap, which is always fun. Bigger and better every night. Judy Cam is a new member. We got members flooding in here. Um, members flooding in. Check out the members community page. Let us know what content you'd be interested in. That goes for you as well, Maggie B., and all the new members here joining during the Brooks trial. A lot of new voices in the crew. We love new voices. We love different backgrounds, different thought processes from around the world, especially Florida. That's where I'm at, in case anybody didn't know that. Alex Pinero, do you believe the judge allowed Daryl to represent himself, to let him incriminate himself with his lack of education? No. The judge would have much preferred him not represent himself I am very, very, very confident in that. If it was up to the judge, he would not be representing himself. Uh, Rachel T. Roca, what's he insinuating regarding the tinted windows? I think he's trying to say that windows were not. And again, somebody asked me this on Instagram, uh, questions like this on Instagram. What's he thinking? Why is he doing this? Sometimes I just don't know why this guy's thinking certain things or what his angles are because they just don't make any common sense. But at the end of the day, I think the window, I think he's trying to say the windows were not tinted, yet nobody saw who it was. How do we know it was him? even though people did see it was him and he got arrested and everybody knows it was him. That's one of his arguments. Linda Slavich, no one else is covering this. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, Linda. And I'm happy to do it. I really wasn't going to cover it because we did another um, pro se defendant earlier that was in Florida, but he wasn't a sovereign. So this is much, much different. Uh, Brenda, Peter, what do you think of Alex Jones's verdict of $1 billion? At this point, it feels like funny money and monopoly money. I have not been following those cases. I know he lost. I know there were damages trials and I knew he was going to lose huge amounts of money. I just don't know if it matters. I don't know if anything, anybody's ever going to collect on this. And a lot of times these verdicts don't mean anything if you don't collect. And I don't know enough about the cases to really give a lot of insight on that. Um, so, I mean, I think it's a lot of money. I don't think it's going to get paid. That would be my thoughts. The witness answers during cross are burying him. I agree. I mean, the witnesses' answers during direct are burying him too. Bev, 
God be with the victims who've testified about their babies as the wicked seems to survive their dead, their deeds. Give them hope that in eternity, all truth will be told and all scales will be balanced. Amen. Love it, Bev. That was awesome. That was an awesome comment. Robin Rogers, do the people who have been subpoenaed have to show up? Yes. If found not guilty, can the state retry him? No, that would be double jeopardy. He's done if he's found not guilty. Jay Goss, can you please explain what the difference between asking leading questions is from regarding from statement summaries and saying, is that fair to say? So he's allowed to lead them on cross-examination. And usually if you're saying, is that fair to say, that usually is a leading question. Like the windows weren't tinted. Is that fair to say? Um, you were only three feet away. Is that fair to say? That's a leading question. When your answer is in the question, that's usually a leading question. That's the way to the telltale sign. AAA, he says, did you, or you did not take me out of the society many times. No matter what I did, you didn't help me. The judge knows that the system has failed, but again, this doesn't mean that the guy is innocent. Becky Sibley is a new member. Welcome, Becky. Marty, in the Cruz case, is it true if the jury chooses death, the judge can change it to life? Yes. Um, we broke this down and I looked up exactly what the standard was and how it was. The judge cannot go from life to death, but they can go from death to life. Yes. Why do you think it is so important to him that it is streamed live for his mom or for his fame? What do you think? I think it's for his fame. I don't think it's for his mom. I think he wants people. I think it's for like, you know, the sovereign citizen, you know, they can see, look, you can do this and you know, you can prove it to them and you can, you know, show, you know, the big bad government that they don't have control over you. I think it, I think it has a lot to do with that kind of mindset. But again, we're talking about getting in his head now. Lost where I was here in the questions. Linda, thanks for the super sticker. Uh, Jeannie. My research assistant, Jeannie here. Hi, Peter. Finally able to be part of a live crew. Could Brooks use mental illness as a defense? Not sure if he had mental evaluation done before he represented himself. Thanks for putting up with me. You're the best. Don't ever apologize. I always feel bad sometimes if I can't respond to all your messages or hit everything that you send, but I always appreciate you sending me stuff. If anybody else wants to send me stuff, let me hide the comment here real quick. At Tragos Law on Instagram and Twitter. Check us out on there. We get in the comments a lot. We get a lot of our content there. Um... But Jeannie is an awesome one that always sends us some good stuff. He actually was going to plead insanity, not guilty by, by reason of insanity. And then he withdrew that. So I don't know if he's planning on saying, I, I didn't know what was happening. I didn't understand, but he can't go with the insanity defense because he withdrew that. So it's still to be seen kind of what his overall argument is. Felicia Williams, can the judge consider his behavior, not his actual decision to self-represent, but specifically his behavior during self-representation when sent, when determining his sentencing, such as lack of remorse? Yes, she can probably consider that, but I got to be honest, in this type of a case, it's pretty clear he's going to get life, multiple life sentences. Pat Turnbow. Off topic question. Have you done a video on rights people way without knowing it? Yes, I did that video, but you just reminded me. I've got to text John. I don't know if we ever posted it. Let me text him right now. Did we ever post the video on rights people wave without knowing it? Because if we didn't, we should have, and it'll be posted soon. I have a trial coming up, which means probably less content in a couple weeks. Maybe we'll post it then, I guess, but I don't know. Um, it looks like he's learning as he goes for the most part. That's why his act is cleaned up a bit. Thoughts? I agree with you, Jesse. I've only got about five more minutes. I'm already over how long I, I needed to go tonight. Jay Melendez. What happens if a juror cries while listening to the testimonies? I wasn't sure if they are allowed to show emotion. I cried while listening. They're allowed to show emotion if they cry during testimony. Obviously, that's a bad thing for Daryl Brooks, but... The judge will tell them to try to control their emotions, but if they cry, the judge will sentence him, Jay.
Peter, do you have any other trials you're thinking about covering? Please cover the suitcase lady. She murdered her husband in a suitcase and recorded it. I have not seen that one. So I like to leave that up to you guys. In the community page and on Instagram and on Twitter, we ask for content ideas. So find us on there. Get involved in the conversation. I know Valo Daybell is one that we've been following. The Alec Baldwin, the Rust shooting case is another one we've been following. But uh, once this one ends, we'll have some capacity for probably another one. Can't cover all of them, obviously. Shelly K, why wouldn't a verdict be paid? Have you won a trial where the verdict was not paid? Do you then not get paid? Sorry, I'm so confused. Yes, that does happen sometimes. It's never happened to me before, um, but it has happened to people. I know a lot of lawyers that this has happened to, and sometimes you don't get paid anything. Sometimes lawyers sue people and know that that's not going to, or know that you know that's going to be the outcome. But they get a big verdict. They get to say justice was served. But a lot of times verdicts are not paid. This is probably a whole other video in itself, Shelley. But we should talk about that one day, Mo. In that case, do you think he will testify? I don't. I don't think he will testify. Southern Mama, I know they did impact statements. I cried, but why can't the family make impact statements directly to Cruz like other trials have allowed? I think they did testify somewhat to that. I have not watched every second of the Cruz trial, but I know the judge or the the jury is hearing a lot of the victim statements. I know they've I know they have. I've seen some of the victim statements to the jury about how this affected their family and about their child that was killed. Monica UK. Hi, my whole family are either police officers, attorneys, and a judge. That's a legal family right there. Can anything come back on the judge at all? One second, it feels like she is helping him. And the next, it sounds like she's frustrated at him. She's doing a good enough job. There's not going to be any backlash on her or anything. And I don't think she's done anything to cross into reversible error where she's, it's going to get reversed on appeal. I don't think that's the case. Um, there's not going to be any serious backlash or anything like that. Jessica uh, Canavo. What did you mean he's in a tough spot with evidence? I think the evidence is just witness testimony, no physical evidence. Um, I think the video is probably pretty severe evidence against um, Daryl Brooks, if you ask me. My opinion would be the video evidence is, is pretty damning and these witness statements. These aren't like hearsay statements or secondhand statements. This is somebody that saw him run over a body. So I, I think the evidence is pretty heavy against him. My opinion, again, and you you could be a juror on the case. It sounds like you don't think there's a lot of evidence against him. And again, that, that will be up to the jury to determine. All right, I have time for maybe one or two more questions. Uh, Z Martin, I'm very behind on this. What was his motive for driving into the people? Did he ever say no TV or cable here? Sorry, I haven't seen a motive. I don't know. I know there was some stuff that maybe it was political or race driven or whatever. I don't think that seems like a motive. I don't know. It seems like he got to find his girlfriend. He fled or something. And then he just started driving through the parade and didn't stop. I don't know if there was an actual motive. So we'll have to keep track for that. Um, but why can't they make statements to Cruz himself? I mean, Cruz is sitting there at council table. I may not be following your question. If I'm not, I apologize. John O'Rourke, 2,000 people viewing our lawyer. Hit that like button. All right. Maybe you did not understand my previous comment. Sorry. When I read about the incident, I checked the guy's history and saw that he had a record that gave us a good idea. This parade murder could have been prevented. What was his motive, you think? I really don't know what his motive was. He did have a record. Apparently, he's hit another person with a car, I believe his ex-girlfriend, He's got bail jumping charges. He did have a record. I get what you meant. So his bond was too low in the other cases. That was my misunderstanding. I thought you were talking about this case. I apologize for that. So, yeah, I mean, but we have these arguments all the time, right? Are we holding people and and infringing on their constitutional rights with too severe of bonds happen in some cases? Then when something like this happens, we understand why bonds and why people are arrested when domestic violence is claimed, even if there's no physical evidence of it, because we do want to protect it. That's what's so hard about um, injunctions and protective orders and things like that. It's a very difficult balancing act that law enforcement judges and lawyers have to deal with all the time. And again, it's no perfect system. And I think there would have been an argument in the opposite way if they would have kept him in jail for the crimes that he was arrested on prior to this one. So I don't know. It's tough. And I really don't know what his motive is. I, I can't see a motive right now as opposed to like, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, Pat Morris. Thank you so much. 
And Christy, thank you so much. From day one, you've been kind, understanding of every comment and knowledgeable in every subject. Not not every subject. People email me about subject all the time. I'm like, I'm really sorry. This is outside my expertise. Uh, they are going to see the SUV. Interesting, Diana B. I did not know that. Cassandra, Peter, please cover Sarah Boone and the suitcase murder. Okay. I'm seeing a groundswell here for it. Let me know in the comments if you're interested in this case, and I'll check it out. I don't know anything about it, literally. Vinny P., I'm from Connecticut. Alex Jones ordered to pay 960 mil to the victims of Sandy Hook. If he can't pay, what happens? He declares bankruptcy. It's possible they don't get a penny. Or they get in line as a creditor with everybody else and try to collect something. Sparkling Dragon, head over to Trials of the Century with Scott Cardinal and Lawn Lumber, Runkle of the Bailey, just showing the love. Absolutely. Our stream is about to end. Go check out their screen stream. Let them know you came from here. Give Rob a hard time for me about something. Just pick something and give him a hard time for me about it. Um, they're good people over there. And that, that's a cool series. I know I've seen some of the topics that they've done. Thank you so much, Jody, for the super sticker. I've got to get out of here. Uh, Steph, why can't the judge simply tell him the state represents the injured and deceased since he keeps saying he isn't allowed to confront the user? I don't know. I don't know why the judge isn't saying that. I would say that. If I was the judge, I would, I would tell him that. 100% zero. Thank you for the super sticker. Lisa Biggers, you are my Florida lawyer. If I ever need one, thank you. I hope you don't. I hope nobody does. But if you do, if you find yourself in a situation where you or a loved one are injured, nursing home negligence case, we just got a call on today. That's horrible. Somebody was abused in a nursing home. Um, car accidents, wrongful death cases. Don't hesitate to reach out. I will give anybody here my ear for free. Hopefully I can help you. I can't help on every case, obviously, but hopefully I can help you if you ever do need it. Okay, that's it. I'm out of here. You all are the best. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your chats and your comments and your questions. Hit that subscribe button, like the video on your way out. Until next time, I'll see y'all.